Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a palmcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories. All before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of the Tomato Timer. Um, today we have with us Abdurraouf Abbas, uh, who is a research associate at Elysio Therapeutics, which is a biotech startup in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so not the UK one. Abdurraouf has a MSc in microbiology and molecular genetics at Michigan State University. Um, he's done research in cancer gene therapy, in HIV-related neurodegenerative disorders, and He's also very passionate about teaching. Um, during his time at university, he was also involved as an instructor for his cell biology, cell biology lab. Um, he's also really interested in rugby and playing and um, skydiving. And he's also recently started a YouTube channel. So I don't know if it's a pleasure for us to have you. How are you doing? Hey, Isabel. Great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm excited to be on this in the show. It's a pretty uh, snowy morning here in in uh, Cambridge. That sounds really good. Uh, it's been cloudy. We've uh, we had some good weather for a while and now it's kind of gone dull and gray again. Um, but getting started, I really wanted to learn a bit more about what you're doing at your startup um, um, in slightly less complicated terms because we're, <laughs> we're in all not, uh, we don't all have microbiology degrees. So tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So what we're doing is we're utilizing a technology, uh, an amplifile technology. Uh And uh, what this technology is, it's uh, a method of delivering uh, a payload, if you will, or, uh, um, you know, a target antigen to the lymph node. So the lymph node is a very important uh, uh, aspect of an immune response where you educate T cells to then um, it's it's basically where you want to educate your T cells and uh, have a... uh, lead to a, a specific tumor, specific response. That's where our ultimate goal is to secure cancer. Um, so uh, in, in, in the past, some uh, strategies to target lymph nodes have been, uh, have been, um, sorry, mm-hmm. one second. They've been unsuccessful. Uh, they've led to high toxicity, but uh, the method that we, uh, our, co- our company is using, which was developed in MIT, uh, it shuttles very efficiently to the lymph node. That's really cool. It's amplified technology, and these T cells become, uh, yeah, activated and willing to destroy solid tumors in theory. And that's what we're working towards. And of course, that would hopefully help in curing cancer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's amazing. So, um, how did you get into um, molecular genetics? What was what was it that interested you? Was it during school, or or were you kind of like specializing as you? kind of went through university yeah so uh it's a funny story well how i chose genetics as a major was was pretty random i was i was undeclared as a major in my second uh Mm -hmm. in my second year of college and i remember looking at the list of majors to choose and genetics seemed cool i'm like oh that one has the punnett squares (laughs) Uh, so i chose that one randomly but what really really interested me in it is when i took an immunology course um i found immunology fascinating and i found that molecular biology is very intertwined with uh with the immune system and you know with different facets of of disease so that's when i realized that uh that's when i realized that okay molecular genetics could be applied to Immunology and immunology was was primarily my and my my end goal uh, uh, focus really. So it was kind of uh, both. Yeah. So I, I just want to kind of um, like pick up on a point you mentioned in passing. Um, when you say undeclared um, as a major, because that's not something that I have have ever had the experience to do uh, in UK based universities. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I'm I'm guessing the the systems are different. So here, when you join a university you could choose what major or what specific field you want to focus on. But a lot of the time you can join as a, just a general major, like let's just say biology or let's just say mm-hmm. general studies or something. And what a lot of people do actually is, um, maybe not a lot of people, but what some people do is they take courses in different fields uh, in their first year. And they kind of, let's say, test the waters with economics, business, psychology, uh, 
biology, let's say they take maybe an intro course in each and they see where they want. So they're undeclared until I think you have two years uh, by the rules or something to actually pick one thing and stick with it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And did you, during this time, were you kind of experimenting with other subjects as well? And if so, what were they? Yeah, I actually took like an economics course. I found that really interesting. Um, And I also took a a course in psychology, which um, was actually at the time I was trying to get into medical school. That was my my interest then. So actually psychology here is a prerequisite for that. So I took that and I found it interesting. Um, Yeah. So those are, those are two that I can think of right away. So actually, you, you mentioned medical um, medicine itself, um, and I guess biology is also quite a kind of a quite dense in terms of information uh, subject. How, how does it feel like? Does it, is it daunting to get into something like that? And uh, if so, what are some techniques that you have learned along the way to deal with it? So I really think the prerequisite uh, to, to, you know, heavy coursework like that um, yeah, it's it's definitely a heavy coursework, uh, without a doubt, especially if you're trying to get into medical school, let's say that coursework is, is pretty intense. But the prerequisite to all that is you have to really want it. You have to yeah. really find passion and why you have to know exactly why you want to, let's say, be a physician or be a researcher. Once you have that defined, then all the hard work becomes very easy to do. And in fact, you look forward to things difficult concepts that you have to grasp with or, or whatnot. So um, for me, truthfully, I didn't feel that until I took an immunology course. Wow. That's when I, that was actually my, my last year of university. When I took my, when I took my, when I took the course in immunology, I was like, this is fascinating. And I went on to do my master's and every course I took there and all the learning that I did in the lab that I ended up joining after that course. Um, <laughs> it was, it was tough, but you know, I was excited. I would go in and look forward to the challenge. It's like playing a video game, but yeah, and putting it on hard, hard difficulty. But you're actually enjoying it. That's that's maybe how I'm looking forward to it. Uh, or yeah, that that's that's a really good analogy. I think um, enjoying the fact that it's difficult, um, and that, I guess once you have the passion to drive you moving forward, it's, it obviously kind of makes sense. Um, I was um, really interested in how you got into kind of research as well. So. Um, you mentioned that you were like kind of once you got into immunology that led you to your master's as well. But how was it that during your time um, to undergraduate and graduate school that you got into research? Yeah, yeah. I can tell you my, my specific story in short, and um, hopefully some parts will resonate with other people. So mm-hmm. during my immunology course, uh, I guess this is, this is not a kind of a, uh, this is not any, everywhere, but in my, in my course, we reviewed papers that were published on campus. And that was really my first proper exposure to research because I loved immunology so much and I loved the research that we covered. It was like a, okay. using a virus to insert a gene to cure disease. And I was like, what? This, normally, this is normally like, you normally think virus, wow, it's going to cause, you know, it's going to mess you up, you know, but no, it really is. And then I learned later on that yeah. you can use the same virus uh, that delivers the HIV, the same HIV virus in technically, and uh, you can uh, you can um, manipulate the HIV virus or something similar, basically, to deliver an actually positive gene. So anyway, things that kind of knowledge really really changed my perspective and what got me really into it. So I actually just I really wanted to 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 be in that center of science and innovation and i didn't know how to, truthfully so what i did was yeah i went to my professor and i told her um I, her name is dr park and she's she's a big role model for me to be honest and she she really inspired me a lot and i went to her and i told her listen i i love this paper and i'm really trying to get into this lab and you know maybe it was just a little bit of encouragement i needed but she was like wow really exciting good job good luck and she would kind of we talked we talked a bit about it and then i just didn't know how to get, in, get how to get into a lab so i actually had to figure it out on myself yeah i went to my advisor um or my my academic advisor and i i told her listen there's this lab i really want to enter um and she said okay uh try emailing this general strategy then was to try emailing 10 different researchers and see which one responds but i don't um uh what's it called i don't um 
I didn't think that would be a good strategy because I really wanted this lab specifically. And I was, and I was kind of stubborn in that way, but I, I, I yeah. straight up went to, went to the guy I found his name's Dr. Amalfitano. I went to his office and he wasn't there. And then I was like, okay, then, uh, oh, sorry, before that, I emailed him twice. I basically wrote a love letter to the lab, a whole page. I spent a whole day in the library just reading his paper um, <laughs> and writing about my experiences. I had some technical skills that I gained from courses. And you should never, that's one thing I will say, you shouldn't uh, yeah. um, downplay that. If you have skills that you learned in your intro biology lab course, or even if you're in your AS, A-level um, science courses, I don't know. I, for, I forgot because I did AS only. Yeah. Uh, if, if you do, I don't know, PCR, I don't even know the basic techniques, but anything you've done, you can put that on your resume. So I presented myself basically in email form twice. And I sent him a, a week later. He said he didn't respond the first time. The second time around, I emailed him again saying, just in case you didn't see it. And he didn't respond to that. I went to his physical office. He wasn't there. I wrote a physical hand note <laughs> and he didn't... Uh, I wrote a physical handle saying, hey, I've been trying to contact you, check, check your email, left it under his door, did that again, still no response. And I was frustrated. I think after that point, I went to the advisor and I, and I, wow. I told her, listen, I really wanted this lab and he's not responding. She's like, yeah, well, you can't, it's, it's a very high demand lab. And I was just, I was like, okay, what does it take for me? Why can't I, this is the first thing I was truly passionate about, if I'm going to be honest, like in an academic setting. This was the first thing that I was like, wow, I'm actually excited for this. And I, uh, <clears throat> she told me there's this, uh, you can, there's this other person that works in the lab. He's a, a PhD and he's, he's uh, uh, pretty uh, high up in the lab, let's say. He's been in the lab for, for quite a long time. So I emailed him and I gave a very, I learned my mistake from the first few emails. I, I looked back, I'm like, okay, I don't want to mess up this email. Yeah. So I reviewed my first email. I was like, yeah, this is way too long. I wrote a whole page basically, and you you know when you when you first intro yourself to someone, you have to make it short, concise, to the point. So that was one lesson I learned for sure. And um, yeah, I messaged this guy. I said, "Hey, listen, um, this is my name. This is my stage. I'm very interested in your lab. I've been trying to reach Dr. Moftano for se uh, several several times, and uh, I'm really interested in this, this, and that." very specific. I have skills in this, this, and this. If I would love for the chance of me meeting you to discuss your research and the possibility of me uh, volunteering in the lab. And at this point, I should mention, there's only one semester left in my undergraduate degree, which is a lot of my friends were telling me this is not going to happen. And a lot of actually my... my well, you're, yeah, you're running out of time almost. Yeah, yeah. No, this is definitely abnormal to start your research. And that's one thing, like, if I could go back in time, I would lecture myself right before joining university. And, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, tell myself all these lessons that I learned. But I would, um, he, he actually eventually, he, first he said no. He said no. He said, he, he said no. But uh, because, he said no because our lab manager, uh, Sarah, is, uh, said, uh, we just, I discussed it with her and we just have too many people right now. And I said, fine, but I'll follow up with you in a month and I'll see what you say. And I emailed her because now he gave me her name. I emailed her and I said, hi, Sarah, I understand. Uh, that's full. Um, if <laughs> this there's is quite a, a stubborn. If there's any opportunity. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was very stubborn at that point. And it was honestly kind of frustration as well because this is truthfully yeah. one of the most passionate feelings I've, I've had towards anything academic and research, let's say. Yeah. And I really wanted it. Um, and I was always thinking, why not me? Like, okay, there's a reason. We're all human beings. We're all capable. Like, what's... What is the factor limiting me from joining? But, um, and then I resolved, you know, not, you can't get everything you want in life. That's, that's, how, that's how it works. So I actually kind of accepted that there's a chance of me not joining, but I put in my maximal effort and I did uh, reach out again. And anyway, within two weeks, after two weeks, um, he emailed me saying, hey, we're actually hiring new people. Do you want to come in and interview? And I said, of course. So <laughs> I, I, yeah. uh, I dressed up like in my, it was uh, pretty funny. I dressed up like super overkill, way over the top, like dress pants, dress shirt, wore, a, wore like a cardigan. Uh, I was going to wear a suit, but that was too much. Uh, I wore like a tie. Um, actually, suit wouldn't have been too much. I would have definitely worn a suit, like uh, probably. So I went in and I was interviewed by four people. 
And this was, I've never interviewed before. This was the most intense thing I've ever gone through. And, yeah. you know, I was interviewing for a molecular biology lab and they asked me a very, they asked me, you know, hey, so what interests you in our lab? And I can't, there's some questions you know they might ask you. So I was kind of prepared for some um, of like why their lab and what, what am I going to do with my career and these kind of questions. And then they, you know, they're like, okay, cool. So uh, if you're in a boat and you're, if you're in a swimming pool, all right, and you're on a boat and you're holding a bowling ball and you throw the bowling ball into the water, what happens to the water level? And I was like, what? <laughs> you're asking me this for a volunteer position in a biology lab? Are you kidding? Like in my mind. So anyway, I forgot how I answered that, but I, I knew the point of the question. It wasn't to get technically right or wrong, because first of all, to answer that question, I'm not a physics major, but I've taken physics and I know there's some like, there's some rule in physics that I learned that I could probably... Archimedes <laughs> principle. <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah. So, yeah. so me, I'm, I was like, okay, the, the point of this is not for a technically correct answer. It was more of, mm. did they want to see if I can think or not and how well I do like in these, do I like answering questions? There's a lot of unknown in research. So that's what they were kind of good at. It's like they asked me a question that yeah. was potentially unknown to me and they want to see how I react. So I ended up, uh, I forgot how I answered the question, but I thought, you know, I'd have to really review my uh, the laws in, in physics, et cetera. And, you know, I showed them some thought in my potential answer. I said, you know, intuitively, I think it might be this. I honestly forgot the, the answer. And it turned more into a discussion <laughs> rather, than, uh, rather than just like a, this is the answer or this is not the answer. It will rise or it will stay the same or go lower. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, that went well. And within um, a few weeks, I joined as a volunteer. So I was in a volunteer for a semester, basically. And I was wow. skipping classes to work more in the lab, and they wouldn't know that. But because classes weren't, the classes were kind of just like, okay, you're learning theoretical material. What are you going to use? But in the lab, I was learning practical things. I'm seeing that they're they have cancer models. They're growing cancer cells. They're treating them with these different things. They're trying to. Um, this is actually another question. So um, maybe I can I can. I can uh, incorporate a question that was asked here yeah. by uh, the Midsummer Neat AKU. He asked, uh, <laughs> what's your experience with gene therapy for cancer and a general summary of the process? Well, this is when I learned it. Um, so I was really excited about it. So there's many forms of gene therapy, but the one I was exposed to, which is one that's very hot in the field right now, is uh, CAR T-cell therapy. So um, okay. what this is, uh, in, in a long story short, so, so one issue in cancer is uh, there's a lot of different cancers, right? And that there's blood cancers and tumors. And so different cancers have different problems, but one of the main, one of the main issues is uh, T cells being specific for your cancer cells. So you, your, your T cells are your cancer killing cells. Um, technically, there's, there are, are other cancer killing cells, but let's say in, 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 a, in a very... Um, <clears throat> T cells are very important in the anti-cancer tumor response, let's say. So uh, one issue is that T cells... Okay. Can no longer detect your cancer cells because your cancer cells have, you know, they mimic your own cells. So T cells can't normally recognize them um, and they ignore them because they think you're, they're normal cells. Or um, T cells enter in a, in a tumor setting. Solid tumors have a very anti uh, inflammatory microenvironment. So any immune cells that come in, they just get turned off and they just kill themselves basically um, for, for, uh, yeah. So CAR T cell therapy, gene therapy, uh, in this case, in the clinical setting, you extract a person's, a person that has cancer, in theory, you can extract their T cells in kind of like a, a dialysis type mach looking machine, let's say. Okay. So you extract T cells, put them in a bag uh, with ice, you ship them to a ship them to like a laboratory this in America, let's say you ship it to like, I don't know, Kansas or something. It's a middle of nowhere laboratory in that laboratory. They will use a retrovirus or lentivirus. These are, these are similar to the HIV virus and, but they have manipulated them so that instead of inserting a gene, a harmful gene, they insert a gene of interest. The gene of interest in this case would be a new receptor, which is CAR chimeric antigen receptor. And what this receptor is, is now it enables 
now when, when it gets delivered to the T cell and it's capable of being expressed on the surface. So now it's, it goes to the surface, now has this extra arm that is able to attach to cancer cells when it first didn't. And this is specific. This is like comes with knowledge of what the proteins or peptides on the tumor surface is or the cancer surface is. Uh, so they, uh, they, in, inject, uh, they inject these cells these cells become upgraded, they become CAR T cells, and they get shipped back to the patient, mm -hmm. inserted, injected back into their blood. And in theory, these cells will go around, these CAR T cells will go around and, and kill these uh, um, cancer cells. And so that was my first like gene therapy exposure, and that blew my mind. And I was like, this is so cool. I love this. And this, fortunately, my lab, the lab that I joined, this is the project I, was, I joined first. It wasn't successful, truthfully, though. We were trying to enhance CAR T-cell therapy. And I should mention this was FDA approved, um, I think, in 2018. And um, yeah, now it's like in, it's seen in clinics. And that's what so many biotech companies here in, in, in America. One of the other questions was about um, what's the field of biotechnology like? Is it growing or, or uh, et cetera? Like, what does it look like? It's definitely growing. There's so much research out there. Every day, we're, there's new publications. With each new publication, yeah. it could come a new biotech company because it's just like my my uh, my company. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, I talked a lot, man. I get passionate about these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, well, it's it, it's obviously visible. And, and congratulations on finally ending up getting your your research position, even at the right at the start. And I think one of the things that I definitely took away from the story was the fact that you just got to be stubborn. You just got to keep at it. Um, even when it seems like there's no possibility. I, I I think I'm quite stubborn, but to re to think that I, after multiple emails, sending physical notes and then still getting rejected um, with, from two, three different people, that, that, that's, that's, that's a lot of strength. Um, and I think that's a very important point for all of us to remember that um, it always seems like, especially at the end of the, at the end of the day, when you're standing and you've, you know, when when we even mention your bio and you have all these kind of you know researches and and all these projects associated to yourself um we don't remember these long arduous journeys where you had to go through so much to just even get into the lab you want to study um but yeah we love that um i guess i wanted to just like obviously it was amazing to hear all your passion so what does it mean for your research right now what what do you see that like cuz you're you're currently working at a biotech startup. Um, does that mean you have given up your academic or are you, is that something you want to keep or, or how does it work? Right. Um, I'll tell you when I was looking for, and I realized we only, but in the, um, when I was looking for, so I should just wrap up the story that I was saying real quick. So people know how things progressed. Okay. I, when I joined the lab, I dedicated 30 hours a week, roughly to the lab. Um, in addition to full-time coursework, et cetera. And I ended up, learning so many skills and being involved with so many projects. And I ended up, uh, long story short, going up to my, my mentor. He's never accepted a master's student before, but he's taken, he's taken PhDs. Okay. Uh, I knew I wanted to do a master's, but not a PhD. So long story short, I just went up to him Wednesday morning, 8 a.m. I knew that's when he, he was there. I went and I told him, hey, uh, Dr. Moftano, sorry to bother you. Can I, uh, are you free for a minute? Yeah. Okay. Listen, uh, I want to see if you can sign this paper. And the paper said, I'll allow Abdul to be a master student in my lab. And so he looked at me, he's like, yeah, sure. He signed it. And I ended up, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I started as a master student and I started, I got involved with many projects. And then recently, so all the way coming up to, so this December, I, in November, I did my defense um, and I, I defended my thesis and I was looking for jobs. Now I, <clears throat> Thinking about my career, I was, I spent time in, I spent, so I spent quite some time in this lab, total of three years. It was an academic lab already. So I felt like I learned a lot in academia and I wanted to learn more in biotech. Uh, biotech has an angle of business and it's more translational in my mind. So anything you're developing biotech goes straight to the patient. So there's a different type of knowledge there. Um, and I didn't, Joining biotech doesn't make you give up, um, doesn't make you give up academia. You can always go back and get a PhD. But thinking about what I wanted to learn next, I'm like, you know, it would be really, it would be really cool to learn how these companies actually take a, 
take one of these things that we're publishing in the lab and actually turn it into something that patients get. Yeah. And I'm learning so much. And the key thing was, okay, but I want to learn. I want to make sure that I don't join a job where I'm just doing technical skills repeatedly. And I was very selective about that. And thankfully, I joined a perfect team where I can learn so much. I actually present quite often and I have to do paper reviews and mm -hmm. I can do some of my own research uh, eventually. And like that's there's so much learning um, in that in that aspect. That's amazing. So I, I guess uh, specifically in, in the role that you ended up getting, even at the startup, it's allowed you to kind of keep pursuing this kind of fire of academic passion that you that you can we can easily hear from your voice, um, while also still uh, being able to learn um, and grow in a startup like really fast paced environment. That sounds like the perfect combo, I guess, from at least even from my perspective, um, who's not done a lot of bio. Um, I'm so sorry, Abdul. It's we're getting closer to the end of our podcast, so um, we we love having you. But is there is there something you'd like to to leave us with? Um, yes, I think resilience is a, a key point in this in this episode. But resilience, and um, I would say, don't underestimate yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the advice I've given, so I've I've taught a lot, and with teaching, I've helped people get into research positions. One thing I've noticed is people under play them their ability or they underplay their potential and i would say you have the control you have the power when you're reaching out cold email to a professor and you have to be concise to the point and present yourself in the best way possible yeah and you'll have a shot and you could do it i yeah that's that's uh that's kind of my my motivational uh spiel right that that sounds awesome thank you so much for being with us it's been a pleasure having you and lots to learn um, and thank you everyone who's joined in live and we hope to see you next week at Tuesday. See ya. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. And that's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, Go to Xenos.org. Bye for now.